Hello, I'm Jim Davis, the director of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, our state's affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book, whose mission is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. And that's our center's mission on the state level. The book featured today is The Fantastic Flying Books of Mr. Morris Lesmore by William Joyce, a native of Shreveport, Louisiana. He is a writer, illustrator, and filmmaker whose work has appeared on numerous covers of the New Yorker magazine and who has won six Emmys, three Annies, and an Academy Award. Joyce began his career as a children's book author, illustrator in 1981 and published his first self-illustrated work, George Shrinks, in 1985. Today, he is the award-winning author-illustrator of more than 50 best-selling children's books and novels, which have been translated into over 40 languages. Some of Joyce's most popular early books include the Roly Poly Oly series that became a three-time Emmy Award-winning animated series on the Disney Channel. There's also George Shrinks, which became a Louisiana public broadcasting television series. Other best-selling titles include Dinosaur Bob and his adventures with the family Lazardo, Santa Claus, the inspiration for Saks Fifth Avenue's New York window displays in 1994 and 1995, as well as a couple of Radco Christmas ornaments, A Day with Wilbur Robinson, The Leaf Men and the Brave Good Bugs, and more recently, The Guardian's Collection, which begins with Nicholas St. North and the Battle of the Nightmare King and ends with Jack Frost, The End Becomes the Beginning. And two of my personal favorites, The Numberlies and The Mischievians. And of course, the fantastic flying books of Mr. Morris Lesmore that became the Academy Award-winning Best Animated Short Film of 2012. Bill Joyce was selected by Newsweek magazine as one of the 100 people to watch in the new millennium. He was named a Louisiana legend by Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And in 2008, he was the first children's author ever selected to receive our center's Louisiana Writer Award and has been featured at our festival six times. In addition to his acclaim as an award-winning author, Bill is also an award-winning producer, screenwriter, and production designer who has turned many of his books into feature films. In 2009, Joyce founded Moonbot Studios, a multimedia storytelling company that produced books, apps, films, and video games. Joyce's new company, Howdybot LLC, focuses on his stories in a variety of mediums and media. He recently teamed up with an impressive group of industry veterans, including novelist, screenwriter, and illustrator Brian Salznick and DNEG Feature Animation to produce the first animated version of F. Scott Fitzgerald's 1925 Jazz Age classic, The Great Gatsby. Morris Lesmore was written by Bill as a story about the transformative power of books with an emphasis on connecting readers and books. In today's world of traditional books, eBooks and apps, it is a testament that the power of the story will save the day. The Mississippi Children's Museum, Meridian, recently opened a permanent library exhibition modeled around a life-size recreation of Morris Lesmore's library so that the story of the power of books can be told again and again. In an interview with Baton Rouge advocate reporter Judy Bergeron, Bill said that writing and illustrating books is his favorite job. He said, doing books is like getting paid for recess. He likes to say that his many accomplishments always start with a story. Howdy, Bill Joyce. Well, hey, Jim Davis, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Good to be seen. Uh, could you tell us the story behind the story of uh, Morris Lesmore and about some of your influences? Sure. I mean, that book came to me out of the blue on a plane ride to New York to see a friend who had been my mentor at Harper 
uh, Collins Publishing Outfit. And, you know, he was there, his name was Bill Morris. And uh, he had been at Harper Collins since they were called Harper Brothers. He'd been there since 1949. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's one of those old school publishing guys. And, you know, the sort of tweed jacket, dapper, well-read, smart as a whip, dry-witted fellas. And, and so he was, it was toward the end of, it was at the end of his career and the end of his, end of his life, he found he was dying of, of cancer and I wanted to see him. And so uh, got on, I heard he was sick and I got on a plane to go see him. And while I was on the plane, this story came to me, uh, the fantastic flying books of Morris Lesmore. And it just was a play on, on Bill Morris's name. And Bill was a really uh, sort of diminutive fellow. He was, he was probably just barely five feet tall. And, but he had this huge reputation in publishing. Cast a giant shadow, as they say, over the publishing industry, a very uh, benevolent shadow. And, uh, and so it, this story just yeah, was playing on the, you know, the fact that he was short but magnificent. And, and he also is very succinct, you know, in his conversation and his witticism. So it just made a sort of sense uh, of calling the main character Morris Lesmore, because in the case of Bill Morris, Less was more. And, um, but then again, it's a lot of what children's books are in the subtext of children's books is that you can put a lot in them, but without very much text, you know? And yeah. so it just seemed right. And it's, uh, it's totally instinctual. And this, this story tumbled out on that plane ride and I sketched it out pretty much. And almost to, and it, it, it's, it, it, it's almost the same uh, as it, the final book in many ways. Oh, yeah. And it all happened in that two hour plane ride. And uh, but I got to New York, landed, went straight to his apartment and he had a hospital bed set up there. And, and we sat and visited in this room surrounded by, I mean, tens of thousands of books and just had a really lovely visit. And the end of it, I told him, well, I wrote this story about you, Bill, and I got to read it to him. And, uh, and he was very touched. It was really sweet. Wow. And then he died three days later. Oh my God. And then Hurricane Katrina, I was working on the book and Hurricane Katrina happened. And that ended up threading into the story a little bit. Um, because I remember going down to New Orleans not long after the storm and I was putting together a, a photography exhibit of just where we went and just interviewed people in the shelters about what happened to them, you know, tell your story. And, um, and we made a couple of trips down to New Orleans during that. And one thing that struck me was how many, like almost dunes of, of books we found there. It, it seemed like um, the debris sort of clustered together in similar things. Like you find huge drifts of, of refrigerators and, and uh, kitchen appliances. Somehow the waters, I don't know, the floodwaters sort of sifted things in this way that categorized them by similarity in some strange way. And, but you were, I found a number of like, these just, you know, house sized piles of books that were all gray. You couldn't write a muddy gray, right? And you couldn't read the pages. You couldn't, all the words were gone basically. And it just struck me like, these are everybody, these are the books from everybody's houses. And, from the libraries and from the, you know, the businesses that, and their stories have been wiped clean in a way. And I wanted that to be a part of the book as well. And so it dovetailed sort of organically into this story. Um, I remember after Katrina and I went, I was working at Jefferson Parish Library at the time. And I went to one of our branch libraries and there were all these books in the parking lot. And I walked upon one and looked down to see what it was, and it was Inherit the Wind. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I, 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 I for sure took a photograph of that. You were talking about coming coming down to uh, uh, after Katrina. You also came came down for for the American Library Association mm -hmm. uh, conference, which was the first major conference uh, held after Katrina. And they were the, the ALA was brave. They took a chance on us, and it, it meant the world to all of New Orleans and to Louisiana that that happened. I and remember that. That, in fact, that's when I first met you. Really? Was yeah. it then? Wow. Yeah. I stood in, I stood in line uh, to get, they were giving out a, a promotional poster for Meet the Robinsons, and I stood in line. You always have a long line. And, <laughs> and, and I met you, and in fact, that's the poster right, right there. Oh, wow. You see? And you signed it, and, and you illustrated it, uh, particularly special. And uh, and then I, I ask you about would you consider coming to the festival? Well, you didn't have to twist my arm. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, that's not true because I hadn't started. At, I hadn't started. At, at, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's when our friendship began. Wow, I thought it'd been even further back than that. No. And uh, I mean, yeah, any, any excuse to come back to Rage was. Cool. with me i mean yeah because i lived there for a little while after yeah i got married yeah. and uh, a lot of fun memories of lsu and baton rouge yeah you know I, I was thinking your readers especially your young readers would would uh, be interested in finding out how you began writing and illustrating books <laughs> well uh i drew all the time and from the time i was like I don't know, maybe before I spoke, I think I was drawing. And um, and my father had a had a clothing store and he would bring on these pieces of cardboard, white cardboard that were used to like put behind shirts and stuff. Yeah. And so they're really nice sheets of paper, big. And and she piles them and I would just draw and draw and draw those things and, and stories would evolve, right? And it sometimes they, and I've seen kids, it's something kids do a lot actually and always have evidently is you start you start on one side of the paper if it's a, it's a wide sheet and you just sort of draw a story across the page and the things that start out on the left side, you know, keep repeating as you go along. And so I was drawing, I was making up stories on single sheets of paper, even back then. And, but the first like, uh, specific story that I told was for the fourth grade, a fourth grade contest, um, to see what kid could write the best kids book at my school. And I thought I had a dynamite idea that I'd been thinking about for a while. I, I'd always liked science fiction and stuff. And, and so I sort of combined a bunch of things. Like I hated math, but I love science fiction. I love monster movies. And uh, so I mushed all that together into one thing because that's what the librarian said. I was like, what should I write about? And she said, um, you should write about what you know. And, and I'm like, well, what I know is I, I hate math and I love monsters and I love uh, UFOs and science fiction. And she said, well, then you know what to write about. You know, even if you don't know those, those aren't facts, but there are things in your mind that you enjoy. Write about that. So I put it all together in this thing called, uh, a story called Billy's Booger. And it's about a kid. Uh, it was very autobiographical. You know, kid's name's Billy. My name is Bill. And uh, Billy hates math. And I hated math. And he is walking home from school one day and he gets hit in the head by a meteorite. And that meteorite is um, from planet Snotron and it gave Billy's uh, boogers superpowers. And the boogers were really good at math and they had super strength and they could fly. And, and eventually Billy could fly as well. And, and, and he, even, he even developed um, chocolate ray vision where anything any food that he didn't like like brussels sprouts or green beans that if he you know stared at them with his chocolate ray vision they would turn to chocolate and taste good 
And so I wrote this story and in, in the story that Billy's bad at math, just like I was, and the boogers help him out with math and save the day and from bad aliens that have come to uh, take over the earth. But Billy has to keep his identity secret. And so whenever he would, you know, danger would come, he would have to you know, say, I have to go to the bathroom. And, uh, and the teacher, okay. And then he would slip out, go to the bathroom and put on his cape and fly away and go save the world and come back. And the boogers would fly out of his nose and fight the aliens with him. And, and then when you know, it was time to come back and, and resume his identity as an average boy, uh, the boogers would fly back up in his nose and hide out there until, until needed. And I did it all in green crayon and green felt tip pen. And uh, I did not win this contest. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, I was, my parents were called in for a, a, not just a teacher parent conference, but a principal parent conference. And uh, where it, you know, it was like, I had to promise not to draw boogers in school anymore. And, uh, but the librarian, they put all the books that were entered in the contest into the library, into the actual school library there at my, at my elementary school. And, uh, and a few weeks after this contest, and I was so, I was kind of crushed that I, not only have I lost, but I didn't even get like an honorable mention. And um, she said, you know, don't feel bad because your, your book is the most checked out book in the library. And, uh, and so that made me feel really good. It was like, well, I, I kind of got in trouble, but everybody likes my book. <laughs> it was a strangely empowering moment for a fourth grader. And, uh, and so, you know, that was fourth grade. I, ha I still had the book, Billy's Booger, uh, from fourth grade. Most of it burned up in a uh, fire that we had at my house uh, where, my, where my garage <laughs> caught on fire. And, uh, but I still had Xeroxes uh, of the original. And, and so I, tr I sort of rebuilt it from those Xeroxes and, and then published the actual book um, at Simon & Schuster, I don't know, a number of years ago. And it taught, it tells the story of like how I came to write the book. And then it's in the center, we reproduced the actual book, the you know, fourth grade book from uh, all those years ago. And then when the, the book came out, I got to go to back to my elementary school and present the first copy to, uh, to the librarian there at my elementary school. And though my, uh, they had not had Billy's Booger in circulation since fourth grade, uh, this new improved or a more extravagant version was now and the library still is. And so it was cool to go back. I went back to my old classroom and I went back to my old locker. Uh, I had a real nice sort of memory lane thing going on there. And even some of, the, some of my classmates from the fourth grade showed up for this. And it's really kind of awesome. That is a wonderful story. And hooray for librarians, huh? There you go, man. There you go. I mean, she, that, it is, that, there's a couple of English teachers and a couple of librarians that really like, like said, you know, this is something you can do. And you, you've got some talent there. It may, it's, it's a peculiar talent, but <laughs> you know, it's and something where you are now. <laughs> there you go. It's kind of funny. Well, I don't want to give away too much about <laughs> this lesson more, but I want to ask you a couple of things about it. Uh, that's, uh, mainly because I want to know the answers or when okay. I to hear uh, your responses. Uh, one thing uh, on, on one of the pages or maybe more than one page, there's uh, the text of a book in the background. Mm -hmm. It's in French. Is yes. that a particular book? Yes, it is. What is it? It is Jules Verne's uh, First Men in the Moon. And yeah. or the journey, you know, I can't remember how it actually translates. Uh, from French to English, but it may be a, a journey to the moon. I can't remember, you know, and, but I have a first edition of it. And, wow. you know, the name of uh, my company was Moonbot. And, and it was about robots who, Moonbots have shown up in a lot of my stories. There are these robots that live in the moon and help the man on the moon do what he does. And, uh, and so they're called Moonbots, not robots. And so it just felt right to 
so I love Jules Verne when I was a kid and um, and still do actually. And since, you know, I don't know, Louisiana is such a French heritage and I was so aware of that growing up. I took French at school from the time I was like in preschool, right? And it just felt right. To, it's that so much of this book sort of hailed from Louisiana um, influences. And so it felt right to have to have uh, Jules Verne in there and to have it in French. Yeah. I mean, I wanted like I didn't want anybody to concentrate on what the what the what the text was in that book. I wanted them to do exactly what you did, which is ask what's yeah. what's what's up. Yeah. Well, it's kind of an Easter egg. There's there's there there's a specific there's actually a, an egg in the story that Humpty. Yeah. Does. Yeah. But are there some other Easter eggs you can tell us about? Oh Lord, all my books are full of Easter eggs. They're just, they're like Easter baskets, really. Um, <laughs> let's see, well, my daughter's in the book. Uh, my wife's in the book. Um, my son's in the book. My friend, Colleen Sally, who is a, uh, who taught children's literature at UNO in New Orleans and was a legend in, in publishing and library worlds. Uh, Colleen, with, she's in the book a bunch, and um, she's in the film too. It was really nice to get to pay homage to her. And her and Bill Morris were very good friends. Um, she actually introduced me to Bill Morris. Really? And uh, so, um, gosh, I think, oh, and Buster Keaton. The more, we designed Morris kind of to resemble Buster Keaton, the silent film star. Um, it's not like I wanted to reproduce. It, 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 Bill Morris remind he, Bill Morris didn't remind me of Buster Keaton, but there was something. <sighs> Buster Keaton was always about his comedy came from uh, chaos, but he stayed calm. Right? They called him the Great Stone Face. Right? And Bill Morris never lost his calm, and no matter what was going on, he just stayed totally focused and dryly. Uh, if I was if, if 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 I was very wet behind the ears, dry, uh, Bill Morris is very dry behind the ears. How about that? <laughs> and uh, and so it felt right somehow to, to to combine both of them, Buster Keaton and Bill Morris. It's kind of nuts, but anyway, I did it. And uh, and actually, you know, it's like New Orleans is in it. Uh, the French Quarter is in the book. Uh, there's a lot. There's like in a way. Things felt after Katrina are very much in the book. That's why the when the storm hits in the first pages of the book, um, I have everything in black and white because that's what it felt like in New Orleans uh, in those first months after Katrina. That everything was kind of coated in this dust and mud, that sort of was gray. It was a strange sort of uh, mournful color. It was like the color had been sucked out of the world, and that reminded me a lot of the Wizard of Oz and. So there's elements of, of the movie, The Wizard of Oz in Morris. I mean, it's it's all this stuff just combined together that I love or that touched me. Uh, you mentioned Miss Sally well, one year uh, uh, as a tribute to her, we had a shopping cart Mardi Gras parade through, through the Louisiana Book Festival. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and that was perfect for her because she, you know, she had her parade. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. through of Colleen. That's right, that's right. I, I was a member of the crew of Colleen. I, I was part of uh, most of the last years of her parade. And, uh, and <laughs> at, when she was, she told me before she died that, um, and she was very, yeah, you, you know, you know her, Jim. So I mean, yeah. she was, she was a, quite a life force. And she told me, in almost like biblical intonations, right? That when she, if she died, that we needed to keep, we needed to make an effigy of her and and continue the parade. <laughs> and so um, we did. We built it the year after she died, the first Mardi Gras after she died. And um, we had that in our parade. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I mean, she would be, I mean, that parade was so much fun. 
And, you know, it's the second line parade that went through the quarter. And I mean, there, she was the unofficial queen of the Vukare. And it, there, there, it was so much fun to go do that because there she is, this, you know, this little old rotund woman in a shopping cart festooned with so many beads and, and her glorious self beaming out, darling, darling, with a gruff <laughs> voice. And she would, every year, I mean, there were times when we'd, the, the shopping cart would stop at an intersection somewhere in the quarter and virtually everybody that lived in that intersection would come out and sing along to Colleen's really ribald um, theme song that she had written. And um, it was like it was like the world had become, you know, Colleen's musical for that one day. And she every year she would all three national networks would spot her and film her and interview her because she was so the essence of sort of what Mardi Gras should and could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really it was really fun to those days were fantastic. They were just bigger than life. And she had a, a, a writer salon. Yeah. Uh, you can call a, it that. Home. Yeah. <laughs> a gathering <laughs> of writers. <laughs> writers and illustrators and anybody fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I read uh, uh, an interpretation or a description of your book that talks about it's ultimately about the transformational power of books. And I certainly agree with that. Uh, that's what that's what the story's what uh, all about, and that's what we're all about. Uh, the the Louisiana Center for the Book and the Library of Congress Center for the Book and all the affiliates throughout the states. So, I mean, it's it's just a powerful book to 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 show the power of books. Well, I'm very proud that y'all chose it and pleased to be a part of it. And pleased to be a part of you know the Library of Congress. It's an awesome honor. Yes. And yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't know, like every now and then, every now and then, and rarely, sometimes, you, some sort of lightning strikes. And as a writer, and you get some clarity, maybe brief, uh, about what you think is important or what you want to tell. And more or less more probably is the most uh, specific and intense of those experiences I've had in writing. And uh, it brought most of the things I care about and think are important together in uh, a short little allegory that I hope says a lot more than just, uh, I don't know, a way to pass the time. <laughs> I mean, there is a line, of, there's a line in the book I really like, if I may be so bold to like one of my own lines, which I don't usually. And I never read my books again. And uh, I've had people quote my books to me. And I go, God, that's, that's not bad. Who wrote that? And they'll go, Phew, yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, I never look back at that stuff. But there's a line in Morris Lessmore that I'm proud of. It says, um, everybody's story matters. And I think that sort of, I don't know, it sums it up for me. That's a wonderful line. Thank you. The more... The more I know you and the more I, I go back and read the book, to me, it's so autobiographical. Tell me why. Because of what, what Morris does with his, with, once he gets to the library and then he starts, there's a line of people that come along and they're still in black and white. Yeah. And then when he gives them a book, they're suddenly colorful. Yeah, and it's just, just, and because of the books that you write, yeah. people's lives are enriched and more colorful because they've read your books. Oh, that's very sweet. I, I saw, I saw you as being that person giving out the books. <laughs> well, that's sweet of you, and I, 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 maybe. I mean, you know, you, I don't usually know exactly what I'm up to when I'm writing these things, and. Uh, they just sort of come out. And then later when people ask me what, what the heck is this thing about? <laughs> or they tell me what they think it's about, like you're doing now. And uh, I mean, I always saw it really as Bill Morris and, and Colleen and all of us who love books yeah. that, you know, 
Bill's philosophy about how to generate uh, publicity or knowledge about a book is very simple. He was like, you hand people the book and tell them you think it's good and the rest will take care of itself. <laughs> and, and that's what Morris Lessmore does. I mean, he hands out stories and they help people find their way. Well, Morris Lessmore uh, eventually became a movie too. Yeah. And you, won, you won an Academy Award for that. That was a wonderful night for us to all to be watching and rooting for, for you. Well, I have to say, <laughs> Uh, winning an Oscar is something I highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the photographs that were taken that are, are you can find them online. Are great. <laughs> I mean, the, the the pure joy in, in all of your faces is is just wonderful. Well, we had so much fun making that film, and I had such a wonderful crew, and. You know, it was all wing and a prayer stuff. And most of the crew was straight out of college. This was their first job. Uh, they come from mostly from the Ringling School of Design in, in Sarasota, Florida. And but they were kids from all over and kids from Freeport, kids from everywhere. And and then a couple of <laughs> seasoned veterans. And you know, it was a we were trying all kinds of new techniques that we weren't sure would work. We were, we were like building miniature sets and then, but all the characters were computer animated and we didn't know if they were going to like blend together and look cool as though they belonged in the same shot, but they did. And I mean, we really didn't know it was going to work at all. And, um, <laughs> and that we did it like here in Louisiana and Shreveport and you know we were up against pixar and all the big boys and and you know we won and it felt it felt like an old andy hardy movie you know when they say <laughs> let's get in the barn and we'll make some ma will make some some costumes and dad will make the sets and we'll we'll put on a show we'll go to broadway and, and in those <laughs> movies it would work they would go to broadway and uh it had a lot of that feel to it for us. And we decided, I have to say, it was like, we're going to have fun with this, right? And because this probably will never happen again. And so we just had a great time being nominated and all the stuff that goes on with being nominated and the, the interviews and the parties and the, and the get togethers and, the, and then being in the academy. I mean, it's so, it's so, I mean, we got to meet so many of our cinema heroes and sit down and talk to them, like really engage them in, to me, meaningful conversation about, you know, talking to Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg and, wow. and all these people that we, different writers that we had just worshiped and cinematographers, editors, I mean, all these guys from cinema that it, it was just, I got to meet Max von Cito and sit down and just tell him what it, amazing actor i thought he was and talk about his performances um through all those years he was 90 years old i think when he was there that year and nominated for um incredibly loud and very close and i don't know it, and then and then and then and then we found out like that this reporter from entertainment weekly had been following us through the through the uh, nomination sort of stuff and he's like these guys are the best story <laughs> going on because they're having so much fun and we didn't know anything about this was going on and so he'd been shadowing us in the night of the oscars after we won uh he came up to us and he said you know we're gonna do a big story on y'all because y'all are the most fun to uh to follow in this y'all y'all are actually having a great time and and he and <laughs> <laughs> and he followed us the rest of the night and talked about all the goofy stuff that we did and how much fun we had. And it was just sweet. Everything about it was sweet. You know, I mean, this, you know, 
could be cynical reporter from a national magazine thought that like, let's follow these guys. They're having a good time. We got home from the Oscars and they're landed in the Shreveport airport and there are all these people with, you know, posters, you know, going, congratulations waiting for us. And then they gave us a ticker tape parade. The first ticker tape parade in downtown Shreveport since the end of World War II. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, it was like something out of a Frank Kaplan movie. It was like just amazing. Well, I highly recommend the people search that out and watch the movie. Oh, read the book first. Yeah, and then and and then find that because it's it's just it's so uh, wonderful to watch. Thank you. And there's an app. There's yeah, you know a lot of that app. stuff. I haven't been able to keep up with keeping the apps, whatever. Uh, current and uh, and you know it's a funny sort of thing you, know, you don't make any money off of a short film right and but it's an expensive thing to do and and iPads came out right when we were doing the short in the book and I was like hey man we should do what what do they call those things that are like applications apps and, and it was like yeah it's like we should man, we should make an app, you know, like a book app, and for the iPad, that new thing is so awesome. And it was like, well, you know, okay, I don't know, like how do you do that? And we found out people that knew how to do that sort of programming, and uh, so we put together that app, and you know, it ended up doing really well, <laughs> and it paid it, you know, it paid for the short film, and. Uh, and it made it made a big impact when it first came out. It was the number one app in the world for uh, a period of time, uh, outselling um, at the time um, Angry Birds, which was <laughs> and but to me like, and I wondered about this at the time. I was like, everybody was like, you know, iPads and these tablets are going to kill the book. It's going to be the death of, of print. Why would anybody want to carry around a bunch of books and they can put it all on this? And I was like, I don't know. I don't think we can. We I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we should treat this new technology as the enemy. We should try to embrace it and see if we can work with it, right? And so you can have two experiences, and they are going to be different. I mean, reading a book is a very intimate. Uh, experience, except when you're reading it out loud. But you know, and even then, it's it's still intimate between the people you're reading to. And, and apps are gonna be a different thing, but why not try to make sure, coordinate the two so that there's, you have a, a similar but different experience, reading and then, and then engaging, right? And that, that they've always said, you know, apps are interactive. I'm like, well, books are too. I mean, come on, you, you imagine so much between the lines in every book and even in a picture book especially I mean it's like you can't show everything that you get from one place to the other that's what that's what kids do or anybody does when they read a picture book is they add to it what's in their head and that's the or and that's interactivity that's and it always works it doesn't like <laughs> doesn't need a battery it doesn't need some compatible component it just happens but if people want to interact with something with their fingers, you know, on a screen, let's, let's give it a whirl, see what happens. And, uh, and for a while that seemed very important that, you know, the experience exp that a pad could, an iPad could, could give you seem as important and would be dominant. And it just didn't turn out that way. I mean, kids like to do things on pads, but they, they, they will it's obvious that people still enjoy opening that ancient thing called a book simple idea of pages bound together with words and sometimes images that they still prefer to do that as well and it's not going away so i, I haven't done an app in a long time and i it and i don't miss i mean I think books are more enduring, and I mean, I don't have to. I don't have to update anything 
<laughs> on a book. You know, you just keep printing them and hopefully people keep buying them or in the, it, they keep reading them. But, you know, with an app, I mean, it's like every six months or something, we have to <coughs> update the program to fit the new, whatever update they put on your phones and, and your iPads. And, you know, it's, it's, it becomes, it becomes wearisome and expensive to do that. So the books are still in print. The apps to me kind of come and go and I'm, I'm glad people enjoy the apps, but to me, the books, the thing. Well, the thing about that, uh, that app was, it was really an enhancement of the book or it was interactive with the book for people not familiar with it. When you got the app, app you uh, aimed your camera at the yeah. book, pages of the book, and then the books became animated. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was like it was like we have to make it a different thing, right? You know? Yeah, it's like just sitting and reading something on a tablet seems redundant, you know, and it's just not interesting. And so I'm like, let's see what this. I mean, this this machine, this this invention, this pad is it can do so much cool stuff so let's make it a different thing it's not going to be it's just going to be a different way to experience that story using everything that we did for the, you know the book and for the short film and and so it was fun to push the envelope to see what you could do and and i'm not going to say i'm never going to do do those again but yeah, you know, it's just, it's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. And I, I find myself at this point in my life, I mean, I've played with every kind of technology there is and been lucky enough to be a part of a lot of the, the change in technology and the exciting things that have happened and be on the cusp of whatever has been new. That's, that's, that's fun to do, to ride that wave. But, you know, as I gotten older, I'm sort of like, it's so, I like working on movies. I like making movies, and I was, in fact, I'm finishing one right now. And I was talking to my producer yesterday. He was in town, and he was like, "So, so, what's it like when you do a book?" And I'm like, "It's the most peaceful thing I can do, <laughs> and it's so zen." And there are times when, I mean, I can just feel my blood pressure just go down to just like the nicest level, and it's just me in my head letting goofiness and whatever's in there spill out and and there's nobody telling me what to do or how to do it and it's just very very it's 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 a solitary but very um rewarding way to work and i find myself enjoying that and appreciating that, you know, hugely now, and, yeah. and that's a gas. It's nice. It's nice to figure out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. <laughs> Can you tell us about your current project? Um, yeah, I've got two. I've got three that I'm working on right now. I'm working on a book called uh, Rocket Puppies <laughs> about the Earth is in a really bad mood and and it needs cheering up and from out of the far reaches of space come these puppies with rockets on their backs and they're powered by hugs <laughs> <laughs> and they're they have a superpower it's called puppy ray vision and if you if you sit with a rocket puppy and look through his eyes and he looks at you and he wags his tail and he sticks his tongue out and his puppy ray vision will banish whatever's ailing you, you know? Uh, and so all the bad moods in the world are chased away by the rocket puppies. And <laughs> it's the goofiest thing, one of the goofiest things I've ever thought of. And uh, it puts a smile on my face every instant that I'm working on it. And uh, so that's a book I'm working on right now. And then I'm finishing up a short film, uh, a new short film called Mr. Spam Gets a New Hat. And I don't know why this fella is named Mr. Spam. That is just the name that came to me. 
but he uh, he has a derby hat. It's set in the 1920s, and his hat won't come off. He cannot get it off. And because he goes to this, his job every day is to get hit in the head with a hammer all day long. And and it's made his hat stick on his head and his dreams can't get out. And so he meets this beautiful woman who's an artist, who lives next door, whose name is Dot. And she wears a polka dot dress. And her paintings help him get a new hat. <laughs> This sounds wonderful. It's pretty daffy too. So we're almost done with that. And uh, and then when I'm done with that, we've been working on, I've begun working on uh, an animated adaptation of The Great Gatsby. Wow. And, um, you know, we're still raising the money for it, but I'm working with Brian Selznick, who wrote uh, the... Hugo Capre, and uh, that's been a gas because I've known Brian's. For, uh, Brian and I've been friends since. I mean, we had the same editor. I mean, since gosh, since I think the beginning of his career, and, and, and you know, kind of like I've been publishing maybe ten years when Brian first got started, and uh, but we've been friends for a long time. It's really fun to work with him, and. Uh, so we're screen, he's a screenwriter and, and I'll be directing this and we are working on uh, art for it. I can say that mostly behind me, you know, designing the characters and the world. And it's just been so mysterious and wonderful to burrow into this book that, I, that really meant a lot to me. Uh, I first read it in high school and really, really, it's one of the things that turned me towards writing uh, very specifically. And uh, it's a mysterious book. It has a great deal of magic in it and sort of alchemy that's, that's almost impossible to analyze and explain. And the more I've burrowed into it, the more amazing it's, it seems. And I've never... I love the book so much, and I've, I've always looked forward to the screen ad adaptations of it, and they've been in the movies, but I've never thought that the movies have really caught that elusive magic of the book, and we're daring to try to capture that magic, and what I'm finding is that it's it's, you know, you adapt. I mean, I've learned this a long time. I've adapted my, my books into the movies, into other media a bunch of times. And, and you, can't, you can't just recreate what's in the book. I mean, that's not the point. Movies are a different thing. And what Fitzgerald has, manages in Gatsby is, is very cinematic and beautiful, but not in the way that like translates to the screen verbatim. And, but he gives you everything you need to actually, I think, capture the magic of the book, but you have to sort of reorder it, rearrange it a bit and put emphasis here and there and context to make it as effective on the screen as it is on the page. And I think that too often, too often, I think that people that have adapted it have, have fallen into trying to stay so true to the book that in a way they've lost the magic of it, right? And because they're going just by what happens in the plot and it's what happens in between the, the incidences in, in the story that I think is part of, is, 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 the, is what gives the book so much power and it's elusive magic. His Fitzgerald's prose and what he explains about the world and the time and the feelings of the characters are in the prose in a way that's difficult to translate visually to the screen. And so all we've been doing is taking what he's written and listening to it as att attentively as we can and seeing things that 
hints and clues that he's given us on, on how to adapt it and how to put emphasis on different different things in the book that almost no one ever puts in the movies and in the movie versions of it. So I don't know, we may fail, but we sure are giving it the college try. And we certainly are approaching it from the, the aspect that we don't want to mess it up because we love the book so much. And I mean, Brian and I really, really love this book. And we're going to do, do it, do as honorable an adaptation as we can manage we've sort of vowed not to invent any new dialogue and really just take stuff that's in the book that like, you know, on the title page of the book, nobody ever talks about this. There's a poem and it's, it's a very short little poem about uh, a gold hatted lover and that the gold hatted lover should, should leap high and, and, and gain her attention. And if, if, if she gives her attention, then jump higher, gold-headed lover. And, and, he, and it's a beautiful little poem. And, and, he, and Fitzgerald says it's written by this particular poet. There it is. Just, there's his name underneath the poem. And it turns out that the poet doesn't exist. And the poem was written by Fitzgerald. And he made this fictitious poet up to write it. And we're making that a big part of the our adaptation of the story. And, and I've never seen anybody even talk about that poem. And, but it, it, there's a reason it's on the title page and it applies. And, you know, that's the kind of thing we're kind of focusing on. And that's a long-winded explanation, but look, it's, it's, a, it's a mysterious, it's the most mysterious and most brief great novel I think there is. And, and its mysteries are tantalizing. And, and I'm hoping that we get all the good stuff. You've given us so much to look forward to. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh my God. It could all end up being terrible. You never know. You've kind of addressed this uh, uh, throughout our conversation, but is there some advice you would give to young readers, writers, I'm sorry. Young writers. Read. everything. You'll learn from stuff. what you read, how, yeah. Yeah, how other authors have approached it, presenting their story. But it's it, it, not even authors, just, I mean, yeah. I took journalism in college. I think I learned more about how to tell a story succinctly mm -hmm. from newspaper writing and particularly sports writing like every sporting event is has a beginning a middle and an end right and those guys have to sit down and observe that story unfold or guys and gals observe that story unfold and then relate what happened in a compelling and clear way and uh I think I've learned more from great sports writers than, or as much than, than anybody else. So, but everything you can read has something to offer. And it's bad writing, shows you what not to do. Um, great writing shows you what you can aspire to. Um, you know, it's, I troll through anything that, shiny enough to catch my attention and i don't care where i mean I, it, menus can be interesting <laughs> just read everything you can well we've partnered with the louisiana writers uh project on something called Lu louisiana writes with an exclamation point at the end I like and i'm so and i'm so pleased that the, it, it's it's a writing contest for uh pre-k through 12th grade. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And they have categories in, in both fiction and nonfiction. I'm so glad they did that as well as poetry. And they have categories 
in English or you can write in French. Oh, that's cool too. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'll send you some information about that. It's, it's Please uh, do. We're, we're really pleased to be able to partner with them on that and that they've been able to keep it going after losing funding and so. Oh my gosh. We're yeah. doing what we're doing what we can help uh, in the ways that we can uh, to help Bravo. keep that keep that go going. I wanted to mention uh, that Morris Lesmore was at the it was at our book festival in oh, yeah. 2018. Yeah. To celebrate our 15th anniversary of the book festival, you were kind enough to create the artwork for that. So Morris uh, where he's positioned here, he would actually be right over the tents of the book festival. And in the background is the state capitol where a large portion of our programs are held. So this is a treasure. Thank you so much for having done that. Yeah, hey, it was, it, I, love, <laughs> I love getting to do that. And first of all, I love the festival. I love that it's right there in front of the Capitol. I love the Capitol grounds. I love the Capitol building. And it's one of the most exquisite, crazy bits of Art Deco architecture I think you can find. And you know, I, I'm very partial to that 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 time and and uh in architectural style. Just just it just it's so uh there's something sort of daydreamy about, you know, those those old Art Deco buildings. There's like the future is going to be awesome, and it's going to be like this. And so, <laughs> any excuse I can, I love the excuse to come down and and prowl around the Capitol building. Uh, and ended up just using a photograph that I found, you know, online, and none of the pictures that I took. And, but it, I got to spend a really nice day spooking around the Capitol building. That was fantastic and fun and beautiful. I, I, you know, every time I've come to y'all's festival, it has been the most perfect uh, autumn day or days. Uh, you guys, I don't know how you pull it off, but you seem to get pretty lucky with that. Well, there may be some connection with your coming and the, what kind of day <laughs> we have, because we've had one, and one pretty awful day in particular, we had to close down and shop at, at, uh, at around two o'clock and, oh, no. and, and they had to lift the books off the ground in the book tent because the water had risen. Oh and, no. Yeah, it was, it was something, but we were back the next year. Well, uh, <laughs> nobody's ever accused me of bringing good weather before, but I'll take that. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to having our festival again this year. And, uh, and we'll continue to give give you an excuse to come back to back. Please do invite me anytime. I love it going down. And uh, our time is about out. And uh, mine too. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, just want to say how much I appreciate uh, you know your assistant Mally and uh, and Robert Wilson with the Louisiana uh, Center for the Book, and of course you for uh, allowing this to happen. Well, I appreciate it, and we love your books, and we love your films, and well, we will remain fans and look forward to what's coming next. Well, thank you Bye. so much, Jim. I really uh, treasure our friendship and and, and you know, our love of books. And uh, it was, I only got to see Robbie for a second there, but it was nice to see him again. And uh, and thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for whoever chose Morris Lesmore for this. It was uh, it's a big honor. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. So long.